or members to remember. Um, as the coordinator, I find quite often that people really aren't sure when their due date is. Um, and it's also just going to be easier for us to administer. Um, I, I do, we do lose some people every time we have a dues collection date. And I always have said, don't pay your dues unless you get an email from me. And I've always wondered if we've lost some people just because they never got the email and just never got the note to pay their dues. So that will all go away now with just one dues collection date. So again, the, uh, the next time dues will be due for everyone is March 31st next year. And there'll be an article about this in the newsletter with my name and email. And if you have any questions, you can contact me uh, using that email. Thanks, Dan. Any other announcements? Moving on. It's now time for our what's up. And typically, what would have Kent Richardson introduce the what's up speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's what's up speaker, Kent Richardson. We'll be discussing FROBS, or fast radio bursts, radio and other bursts. Kent. Yes, now I gotta share my screen here. Fast radio and other bursts. This kind of picks up from where I left off back in April when I uh, gave a presentation on fast radio bursts. A whole lot has happened, a whole lot has been learned, uh, and a whole lot has been learned by myself since that date. We'll start with radio. Um, just the day that I gave my, uh, what's up in April, the 28th. Nothing on the screen. Nothing on the screen? Uh, you should, I did click shave, share screen. You have to actually, you have to actually click on it and then hit the share in the corner. I did, I did click on share. Okay, I've got to get back to that place then. Uh, no, that's not it. I'm stuck in there. All right. Now, where'd it go? I had clicked on the share screen. Because all I'm seeing is my screen now. You're seeing nothing? We see you, Ken. You see me. Well, that's weird. So here's how you do this. Go to the share screen. Okay, share screen here. That'll bring up all the things that are open on your screen. Click on whichever one you want. Yeah, go that's to the that done. And then go to the bottom right corner where it says share. Okay. Now, do you see PowerPoint? Nope, not yet. Well, I am, all right. Try, try again. Go back again, share screen. There we go. Okay, you're seeing a uh, view above the earth and the moon? Okay, now we can get into it. Okay, now are you seeing my title? Fast radio and other bursts? 
Yep. Okay. Yes. Good to go. Uh, except I don't want to have the gallery in here. Okay. Well, we'll start with radio. Um, as I was trying to say before, uh, on April 28th, when I gave my presentation on fast radio births, lo and behold, an FRB, fast radio burst, burst was discovered in our galaxy. Uh, its name is SGR 1935 plus 2154. I wonder what that name means. SGR means soft gamma repeater. Uh, the 1935 is the right ascension and the 2154 is declination of the uh, the object or the source of the uh, fast radio burst. Originally it was thought to be about 30,000 light years away but uh, some x-ray analysis uh, that came along with it, um, something that had never been seen before, uh, allowed them to refine that distance to 14,350 14, light years. Now, uh, if you recall, in 2017, Dr. Casey Law from UC Berkeley talked with us about uh, fast radio bursts. And two year, or a year later, in 2018, he co-authored two papers on the most active FRB known so far, FRB 121102. Now FRBs, since most of them are not, uh, can't be identified with a specific object that's generating them because they're extra galactic. Uh, instead, the designation tells the date and the number on that day uh, that it, it was um, found if, or discovered. If, if there's more than one. So in 2012, November 2nd, this FRB was discovered, but just this March, they determined that it has a 157 day cycle, something that wasn't known until just very recently. I reported on one that had a 16 day cycle. This is the second one that's had a very definite cycle. And this is emanating from a galaxy about 3 billion light years away. So we don't know what galaxy. Um, what we do know is though that pretty much all fast radio bursts come from some form of neutron star. Um, there are three major types and a whole bunch of subtypes. Uh, magnetar is a neutron star with a very strong magnetic field, about a thousand times more than a normal neutron star. And that's about a trillion times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. Now, um, the uh, pulsars, we've heard about those for a long time. There's a roughly 3,000 3, known, and um, they are emanating from neutron stars that emit twin beams of radiation from their mag magnetic poles. Um, the, since uh, neutron stars have such strong, strong magnetic fields, um, they actually produce gravitational lensing. Uh, those that we can actually see uh, with some form of telescope, we can actually, not necessarily optical, uh, radio telescope perhaps, we can see some of the backside. Uh, and some may have exoplanets. Uh, magnetar plus pulsar it combines both features, the pulsar and the magnetar. There are about six of those that are known. Those gray beams, those are the radio beams. Now in uh, 1965, six, excuse me, 1996, 1999, uh, Hubble actually got some images of a neutron star passing by, streaking by. You see how far it moved in three years. 
I don't know what that distance is. It's believed that that may be the closest neutron star to the Earth. Uh, they believe it's about 400 light years away. Now, there are a number of isolated neutron stars. This is an artist's uh, rendition of one. Um, the astronomers at um, Penn State University uh, knew of seven of these uh, isolated neutron stars. They have no supernova remnants, there's no binary companion, and they give off no radio emissions. Um, so they got to calling them lovingly the Magnificent Seven. Well, lo and behold, an eighth was found. Uh, it's uh, a uh, the designation 1RXS. It's, uh, I, I believe it's, um, well, I, I don't know, this, these naming conventions are really hard to follow because they, they vary so much. But it, it, it is a known neutron star. They decided to call it Calvera because if you remember the movie, The Magnificent Seven, Calvera was the enemy. He was the guy that the Magnificent Seven were hired to get rid of. Uh, this sits very high above the plane of the Milky Way. Um, so there were eight new, uh, isolated neutron stars when Calvera was discovered. Now we know there are 10 and counting. Now this is uh, an attempt to explain how the radio uh, beams are, the radio waves are uh, uh, projected. Um, those loops you see there are closed magnetic field lines, but you can see some of the field lines go outside of this uh, cylinder that's defined there. At, at the rate of a, the spin of a neutron star, which can be anywhere from three seconds per rotation up to 700 rotations per second, um, the magnetic field lines can't keep up uh, the wider ones because they're turning at relative, relativistic speeds. Uh, they would have to be turning as fast as the speed of light, which is impossible. And so they're broken. So uh, what's been defined as the light cylinder is the boundary where those lines can close and reconnect. Um, particles are accelerated by the pulsar and they stream along the open field lines, the open ones, and produce radiation that stimulates a cascade of additional particles which radiate as well. Because the particles are moving close to the speed of light, the radi radiation is beamed in the direction of their motion. The bulk of the pulsar's radio emission is produced at some uh, particular point above the um, uh, magnetic pole, two poles, and then each magnetic pole where did my cursor go? There it is. Uh, and, and confined to a narrow beam defined by the field line orientation at that height, which largely points vertical. Hence, the beams appear to emanate from the magnetic poles. Here's another NASA uh, interpretation of what a uh, a neutron star looks like with magnetic field lines, the spin axis vertical here, magnetic axis is at an angle. And this is an animation they produced that will give an idea of how the, we see the beams, if I can get it to work. Uh, 
worked fine when I wasn't online. <laughs> I'll have to ma manually pull it across. You see the stars rotating, I mean, the neutron star is rotating on its spin axis, but the radio beams, those purple kind of plumes, are moving with the um, magnetic axis. And as we change our viewpoint and start looking into the path of a magnetic pole, we get a burst finally hitting us in the eye, like so. And that's the burst we see from Earth. Okay, gamma rays. This is some of those other bursts I was talking about, or plan to talk about. I, I mentioned a gamma ray pulsar earlier, um, but didn't go into an explanation of it. This is a, uh, an attempt to explain where the gamma rays are emitted from in a neutron star. Here again, we have the magnetosphere, this blue area. This is the magnetic axis where these radio beams are coming out. The gamma ray emission beam comes from what they refer to as the outer acceleration gap. It's coming near the, from the magnetic pole, but aligned with magnetic line. And so you get gamma ray beams. And much like the radio beams, as the star turns, and depending on its orientation with the Earth, we may witness one of these beams as it sweeps past us. And then we have x-rays. Um, here's a couple images of uh, Pulsar J0030. It has some hot spots and as the star rotates, those hot spots generate x-rays and so they will create x-ray beams. Um, the star itself, when a, a neutron star first forms, is about, oh, a trillion uh, degrees to Kelvin but it eventually cools down to about a million degrees. These hot spots are about 15 million degrees and they will emit X-rays. Come on, I'm trying to get it to switch pages and it's not doing it for me. Come on. Okay, here's another type of pulsar called an anomalous X ray pulsar. Uh, it's anomalous because it uh, doesn't have a lot have a lot of the accoutrements that other pulsars have. This is uh, one that has a binary companion. However, this binary companion happens to be a fairly large star. They can be anything from a white dwarf to a red giant. But what happens is uh, a an accretion disk is created as the neutron star draws material from the companion star into that disk and that material finds its way into the magnetic poles of the neutron star 
wherein they create x-rays that are then radi radiated back out. So these beams are x-ray beams. There also may be coincident radio beams. Sometimes you can get both. Uh, you can get all three. As a matter of fact, neutron stars can radiate in almost every part of the uh, spectrum from radio waves to gamma rays and in between. Uh, ultraviolet light, infrared, um, We've already talked about radio waves, like gamma rays and x-rays. Uh, and they do em emit visible light. And if we were close enough, it would be an extremely bright light, brighter than most stars. The problem is neutron stars are so small. I didn't mention this, but they're about 10 to 20 miles in diameter. And they're just solid neutrons. They weigh trillions of tons in just a small space. And so the light coming from that small 10 to 20 mile diameter sphere isn't very bright unless you're quite close. And so we don't generally see them in visible light, but they do emit. And here are my sources. Okay, that is it. I'll accept any questions. Kent, I'll start off with a question. Why is the axis of rotation different than the magnetic axis, if you know? Well, it's about the same as the Earth. You know, our magnetic poles are not co-aligned with our geographic poles. Correct. And the same thing happens to stars. It's pretty rare that they would be aligned. They could, but so far we haven't seen one. Any other questions? This is a really fast moving area. There's new stuff coming up almost on a daily basis. Well, I'll ask another question. The typical fast radio bursts, are we sure that those are coming from neutron stars? I'm sorry, what was the question again? For the typical fast radio burst, are we sure that it comes from a new Yes. We're like, at this point, we're almost 99.99% .99 sure that they all come from neutron stars. Uh, a few months ago, I had a whole laundry list of different proposals, including extraterrestrials. <laughs> that has, I think, definitely been ruled out, as have many of the other theories. It's kind of boiling down to neutron stars of one form or another, whether it's a, a, a magnetar uh, or a, a pulsar. Um, yes, neutron stars seem to be the, the cause. Or the source, I should say. Anybody have any other questions? Feel free to use chat or to unmute your microphone. Okay, no questions in chat. All right, thanks. Thanks, Kent. Again, if anybody has any interest in doing one of these. I'll tell you something. Uh, it's almost easier doing it this way than in person at Lindsay. <laughs> mm. 
I can read my notes. There I'm in the dark. I've got to have huge notes to be able to follow them. Well, with that, why don't we go ahead and take a short break, five minute break, and then we'll start with our main speaker. All right, Steve, would you like me to start sharing my screen and see if we can get that up and running? Uh, sure, why don't you go ahead? Okay, let's hope this goes. Up. In a couple minutes before we get started. Oh, I see, you cannot start your share screen while others are participating in his sharing. All right. So well, I'll, I, can, I can fix that. You can overcome that, get good as the moderator. Excellent. There you go. All right, okay. Screen mode. Yay. Good. Mm -hmm. Totally painless as these things go. <clears throat> Good. More minutes. Make sure everybody gets back to their chairs, couches. Yes, I have the uh, meeting running on two computers so I could see if it was actually projecting or not. That that might be a safety precaution. I actually saw that there was another Jeff Moore there, so you know, I don't know why that was. It's like the Bonga.
Okay, it's time for our main speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce our main speaker, Dr. Jeff Moore of NASA Ames. Dr. Moore is a research scientist at NASA Ames Research Center and is an imaging team lead for NASA's New Horizon mission. In addition to the New Horizon mission, Dr. Moore provided leadership and participation on other NASA planetary mission science teams, including the Europa Clipper mission, many Mars missions, and research on the Galilean satellites. It's my pleasure to present Dr. Jeff Moore, New Horizons, NASA's Pluto Kuiper Belt mission. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for inviting me out to your meeting. Uh, I have uh, had the honor of presenting uh, interesting results, at least they were to me. Uh, uh, in the past, I hope you'll find this interesting as well. Um, as you all know, the um, uh, encounter took place almost 20 months ago, so we have a fairly well developed, uh, uh, I give you fairly, a fairly well uh, developed report on what we've uh, seen and discovered, or think at least at this point. So let's go to the first slide. So the New Horizons spacecraft was launched on an Atlas V, it was uh, the most capable uh, booster the US had at the time on the 19th of January, 2006. Uh, it, at the time of its uh, uh, transplanetary injection from Earth orbit, it was the fastest man-made thing, or I can say human-made thing, to ever leave the orbit of the Earth. It crossed the orbit of the Moon in 11 hours, and it uh, flew past uh, Jupiter for gravity assist 13 months later. Okay, let's discuss the scientific payload of the spacecraft. First of all, New Horizons itself is about the size of a uh, a baby uh, piano, a baby grand piano. Um, it's powered by an RTG, which you can see uh, sticking up uh, just behind and to the uh, right of the high gain antenna. Uh, the main instruments that we uh, used, especially for this encounter, were the uh, camera system, two camera systems, and the uh, spectrometer. The uh, Ralph instrument is actually two instruments. It is a, a wide angle, multicolor um, scanning camera in the visible and near infrared. And then there is a beam splitter, which sends uh, the near to mid IR to, maybe just the near IR really, to uh, um, a separate sensor called LISA, which uh, has uh, 255, 254 uh, channels, which we can use to, to actually do spectroscopic analysis. And then there's the LORI instrument, which is a uh, uh, 1024 by 1024 uh, CCD um, framing imaging system that basically uh, has the optics of a Celestron 8 for all intents and purposes. Um, and it has four times the angular resolution as does the uh, scanning color camera MBIT. And then there are other instruments, uh, SWAP and Pepsi are uh, not uh, uh, Japanese drinks, but they're in fact uh, fuels and particles experiments, but since I'm a geologist, I'm not going to discuss that in any great detail. And REC stands for the radio uh, experiment, and we used that to um, do some biostatic uh, radar uh, uh, work. It was particularly useful during the encounter with uh, Pluto to make careful measurements of Pluto's atmosphere. Okay, as I mentioned before, the spacecraft was launched uh, in January 2006. It flew past the Jupiter system uh, 13 minutes later in February 2007. Uh, we encountered the Pluto system just a little over five years ago on Bastille Day of uh, 2015. Uh, and then we had our encounter with the KBOs and we continue to uh, operate as a KBO observatory. We've only flown very close to one of them where we've actually resolved the target, but we continue to make all sorts of um, photometric studies of uh, objects which are within a AU or so of the, of the spacecraft as we fly past them. And of course, uh, the spacecraft has a unique um, uh, viewing geometries for phase angles and things like that you simply can't accomplish from Earth-based observations. Okay, as I said before, we flew uh, past the Pluto system uh, five years ago, and it turned out to be uh, quite remarkable, as I think you all know. Um, I think I spoke to your uh, uh, group soon after the encounter and gave you a report on what we discovered. Um, there is a forthcoming University of Arizona Space Science Series book that uh, will probably be the uh, um, 
reference book for the Pluto Encounter will be coming out within about six months. Uh, and I think it's already for sale on Amazon, although it will not be printed in, until January. And there's any number of, of papers and other uh, uh, reports out on the subject. Uh, and of course, if any of you are interested in any of those reports uh, and you can't get them yourselves, there's a chance I would have them. I'd be happy to um, uh, send you a PDF as long as it's not any bigger than 20 megabytes. Okay. Um, so we have an extended mission. We're still in the midst of it, um, which is the Kuiperville extended mission. Uh, and we did have our flyby of what's now known as Arakoth uh, on January the 1st, 2019. It, as you know, had several other earlier names. It was initially called uh, 2014 MU69. Uh, and then we gave it the nickname of Ultima Thule for uh, a while, but the IAU is named it Arakoth, and that's the name we used this evening. Okay, uh, I'm sure many of you know about the Kuiper Belt object families. Uh, we were, it was just good luck on our part that we happened to uh, find within uh, reach of the spacecraft's uh, uh, fuel budget, a, a cold classical. The cold classical Kuiper Belt objects are probably the most interesting from the perspective of understanding the origin of the solar system because this is a population of objects which appear to be gravitationally unperturbed and which the original material of the Kuiper Belt since uh, the coalescence of the first uh, planetesimals in the solar system. In other words, these Kuiper Belt objects are the, uh, the primordial planetesimals um, and because of the, uh, the low density of objects in that space, we thought they would also be relatively unaltered. As you can see, that in fact turned out to be the case. And as you can see on this diagram, there are obviously other types of Kuiper Belt populations out there, particularly the scattered ones, which eventually become comets and things like that. Okay, uh, the Arakoth encounter was much more challenging than our Pluto encounter. The target itself was 80 times smaller in diameter than Pluto. Um, in order to get good views of it, we had to fl fly four times closer to the target than we uh, did with Pluto, uh, Pluto, which is the uh, closest member of the Pluto system we flew past. Uh, this requiring far more navigational precision and this requirement for more navigational precision was um, uh, of course pathologically conflicted with the fact that we had only discovered the object in 2014. Uh, it has a very slow uh, period around the sun as you can see of 293 years and so the ability to refine its location precisely especially in the down track um, a direction was a tremendous challenge and it was um, quite the unsung victory that we were able to be right on target, right down to the point that we could frame it uh, during closest approach of our 1024 by 1024 framing camera, an object which is about the size, an apparent size, an apparent diameter, the time of closest approach as the field of view of the camera. So even had we been off 15%, we would have clipped the image, which we didn't. So um, as I say, it was a remarkable uh, accomplishment. Uh, we didn't know whether the, these objects might be surrounded by clouds of dust and debris, which would, uh, of course, cause damage and could even destroy the spacecraft if we encountered them. And we did an elaborate study to figure out where there might possibly be theoretically rings and things like that, and conducted an intensive campaign of observation as we came up on the target to make sure it was a safe, that our, our flight path was safe to travel through. Uh, made more it was also more challenging than Pluto because it's four times darker than Pluto and are already operating in a very low light environment where the sun is, you know, 1,500 times dimmer than it is, greater than 1,500 times dimmer than it is here at the Earth. Uh, this, as the spacecraft operates on um, the decay of plutonium-238, that means that, of course, as the spacecraft continues to travel out, our power source declines. And then of course we have a 12.25 hour round trip uh, light time. So we had to strongly rely upon our uh, uh, autonomous behavior of the spacecraft and make sure we really dotted all the I's and cross all the T's several times to make sure we had a down pat encounter plan. And here's that encounter plan. Uh, Arkoth is shown at the bottom of this diagram uh, as a bar because we planned uh, to scan uh, you know, a couple of sigma of uncertainty in the actual position of the target when we put the plan together. Now, as it turned out, everything was smack right in the middle of where uh, it was supposed to be. And had we somehow known that before the encounter, we could have uh, tucked in a few more observations, but we decided to 
better be safe than sorry. And we uh, uh, planned observations across the, uh, um, the volume of uncertainty. Um, and that's why you see uh, all these uh, start and stop boundaries for the, uh, for the individual observations against a bar instead of a point. And you can see we did several things such as infrared, daytime thermal, which used the uh, uh, antenna itself as a radiometer. Uh, color was used, uh, again, using the color component of the Ralph instrument, best infrared using the infrared component of the instrument. Uh, best black and white was done by using the framing camera. And then as we passed on by, we turned some of the other instruments behind to search to see if there were any kind of outgassing or dust or unusual UV signature or anything op uh, operating against the Lima Alpha background, things of that nature. Uh, the first image that showed any shape were only taken a couple of days before the encounter because the thing was so small. And on the left is a, a raw image of just actual pixels and then uh, playing games with the pixels, we came up with uh, understanding that the object was oblong. One of the things that really challenged us is we didn't get any kind of light curve on the approach. We had no idea how fast the object was rotating. And we tried to understand what that was and the least uh, uh, difficult explanation was either it was, it was spherical or else we're flying down the pole and it simply isn't changing its aspect ratio much. And that in fact turned out to be the case as you'll see. Uh, within uh, one day, the day before the encounter, we got down to having some real sense of the object size. It was about 33 kilometers across. It was apparently bilobate. And then on the very day, the encounter, the first uh, lossy image we got back on the ground uh, showed uh, that it uh, was very definitely a contact binary, something which people had uh, speculated and believed based upon occultations and other types of observations that they that was uh, a um, something you would find in the outer solar system not actually seen with these uh, things uh, live and up close before and of course uh, because it looked at, at the time of encounter we called it the snowman and so in our initial thinking about uh mu 69 we i'm sorry harlkoff we um we imagined to be two spheres stuck together now here's the highest resolution uh, of the so-called MBIC images and the black and white images from LORI are slightly higher resolution like a factor of three roughly, uh, but they have a slightly less good signal to noise. So they're kind of about the same to zeroth order approximation, of discriminating small features and so on. And here you, get, you can see there's a small lobe and a large lobe, which we're referring to them as such. And, and uh, we'll discuss here in a moment, the, uh, the notions that we're looking at the merger of two planetesimals. Now here is a um, video showing the, uh, the rotation we put together from the uh, closest approach images. And from that, we were able to determine it had an approximately 16 hour rotation. And that's not terribly unusual for cold classical Kuiperville objects from the ones we've been able to measure. And now this is an interesting image because if you watch the one on the left, this has been derotated and resized and you can begin to get the sense as you watch this that in fact what we're looking at is not two uh, spheres connected together but something else and I'll let this run for a minute for your viewing pleasure. Okay so and here is sort of a stereo view. We took the, the, our two best stereo pairs and, and just did a, a merger, a little bit of CGI to have them blend one to the other. You'll notice as it nods downwards, you'll see little craters appear in the high resolution image. Near the Terminator, which you can't see, uh, but it's nodding upwards into the lower resolution data product. But it also gives you some sense of size and also a sense of uh, what this object really looks like close up. And for those of you who can do cross-eyed stereo, I'll give you a minute to cross your eyes and you can see it in stereo that way as well. And all these products, by the way, are, are available uh, at the um, Applied Physics Laboratory uh, New Horizons website. If you type in APL New Horizons, it will just come right up on your browser. And you can fish around on the, uh, the public release products and find all these things for your, you want to look at them in more detail. Okay, so as I alluded before, it turn, turns out not to be uh, two spheres, but really two thick 
discs. Um, and uh, this is the, uh, the, not the most recently, as it turns out, I just heard a, a presentation earlier this week that people have slightly re revised shape models, but this is uh, very close to what, in fact, our current models do show. Um, and as you can see, it does uh, have a, uh, um, they are in interestingly shaped objects. They're like, they are like kind of two very thick hamburger patties or something stuck together. Uh, the view you can see uh, in D and C is where we also took uh, higher resolution imaging and we were able to derive a, a, a digital terrain uh, model. And we superimposed the digital terrain model then on top of the, um, the shape model was derived from uh, more classical photometric properties. And, and uh, I apologize, this is a slightly older version, so therefore the, the, um, the discs are thinner, but it was also the only neat graphic I had to show. So this at least illustrates almost, you, you know, an exaggeration how, um, how especially the, the larger uh, um, lobe on the right is not as thin as that, but certainly the one on the left is about approximately correct from what uh, it appears to be. Okay. Now, as you probably have already noticed, the small lobe uh, is different than the large lobe. Um, the small lobe has a lot more um, features, textures, patterns uh, uh, on the surface than you can see on the large lobe. For one thing, the small lobe has what we believe is a uh, impact crater, although it's a very funny shaped and very shallow impact crater. It simply seems deeper than it really is because of its proximity to the uh, Terminator, which of course anybody who's looked at the moon is very familiar with. Um, there are also a number of uh, things which are more interesting tectonic features, different types of material we've identified, and so on. And the uh, mapping you see on the right is available uh, in the paper by Spencer et al. And, and, and there's an earlier version of that same map in the paper by uh, Stern et al., which are both published in the journal Science, and if people out there are interested, I'll be happy to send you copies of those papers. Now let's look in some detail of, of the other things. Well, before I leave, I'll mention that you can clearly see the larger lobe, uh, in turn, is rather more bland in a relative sense, and uh, we'll discuss what we think is going on there here in a minute. Okay, of course, the first thing people wanted to do is look at uh, the crater counts, and as you can see, the object is very lightly cratered. Um, and this is consistent with modeling uh, done by uh, Green Street et al. Uh, that uh, suggests that, um, that the density of objects soon after the end of gas drag and, the, and basically the appearance of the, of the new solar system from, uh, from the solar nebula uh, was so devoid of other objects that hardly any other thing has encountered this target in four and a half billion years. So we're looking at a very primordial object that has not been substantially damaged by impact cratering the way, say, the asteroids are or the inner solar system. In fact, here is an ex example of the apparent paucity of craters relative to inner solar system objects. The image of Phobos, the moon of uh, Mars, uh, on the right, uh, we processed it to exactly duplicate the um, DN spread and the point, uh, the uh, PSF um, and the other, and the resolution of, uh, of our encounter with Arakoff. And indeed, this is this image of Phobos is what Phobos would look like had you put Phobos out, if you darkened Phobos, put Phobos out uh, to where it's 42 AU, and then you flew past it with New Horizons, the same geometry that you flew past um, Arakoff. So you can see that uh, Phobos, for instance, had is much more cratered and much more textured and has um, a lot more interesting, um, uh, or has different interesting features on it that, than the ones you can see on, uh, on Arakoth. Um, and so this is comparing apples of apples in this case. And I think that's very interesting and informative. And I'm uh, particularly fond of this picture because it gives you a, a sense of how far fewer craters struck, have struck Arakoth than Phobos. Okay, let's talk about the possible role of collisions of, uh, on Arakoth tectonics. So there are two collisions worth discussing. Uh, one has been informally named Maryland, which is labeled ND in the center bottom image. And so we wonder if, for instance, like this plateau unit, which you see is P in the center image, uh, is either an impact-induced uh, load that's pushed up by the impact of Maryland, 
uh, or is it a, uh, a block that's been uplifted and mobilized by the merger of the small lobe to large lobe? And likewise, uh, the grooves, which are the white arrows in the center image, you know, they could be uh, extensional features associated with the impact of a Maryland, or they could be fissure, fissures created by a, a fracture response of neck instability between the small lobe and the large lobe. And if either explanation is, uh, is the case, the implications for the mechanical properties of the interior are, are fairly substantial. Uh, it probably means that the small lobe is very porous, although that's still speculation. And so therefore, distal impact damage from a Maryland impact, event, for instance, would be greatly reduced, like an impact into aerogel. Uh, that's the slow density of about 0.5 grams per cubic centimeter is, for instance, what we get for common for comets and maybe common for many hyperbolic objects. Uh, and the, it's interesting to note that the steep regions around Arakoth's neck may re represent additional internal uh, strength to maintain, must have you know, internal strength to maintain. And so we did a calculation that the cohesion of the material that make up the neck has to at least be several hundred pascal, which is about the strength of fresh snow when you go out and crunch on it, uh, should you go up someplace where there is snow. Um, and so it has at least that kind of strength to support uh, the, um, the, the two lobes being connected the way they are. And again, that's consistent with what we learned about comet-like bodies, particularly from the um, Rosetta mission. Now, one thing we saw in the smaller lobe was the possibility of these, um, these uh, scarps, which uh, showed the crescent uh, um, patterns. And we speculate that perhaps that's an example where this unit DM is labeled uh, in the left image and the edges of which are pointed by the black arrows on the right is an example of scarf retreat. And that wouldn't be surprising if it were there. Uh, we uh, have good reason to believe that at least when Arakoth was first formed, it had uh, lots of uh, methane and um, nitrogen and the sublimation of methane and nitrogen even at this tremendous distance would have taken place fairly quickly over millions of years or hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and the, particularly in the case of uh, methane, which also uh, photolysizes into uh, heavier, uh, less volatile compounds in form lags and basically eventually choke off further sublimation, leaving this sort of retreating scarp pattern that's uh, suggested by the Hatcher pattern uh, on the map on the left. And there's an example of a similar type of Swiss cheese type terrain formed uh, in uh, dry ice, carbon monoxide ice on the south polar terrains of uh, Mars. Now, uh, also we saw, noticed there were bright deposits and depressions at the base of slopes. And we actually finally got good uh, topographic models. We discovered these bright patches always occur uh, in basically the local depressions and holes. And we're not quite sure what that is. It could be downslope movement of fines. Fine material, you powder it, tends to have more, reflect, more reflectivity than coarse particles do. I think most people had that practical experience around the kitchen and elsewhere. Or also could be vaulted at the deposition from coal traps or something we haven't thought of yet. And so we've explored both ideas. And so a, a diagram on top is um, courtesy of Orkan Umarad, a colleague of mine here at Ames uh, and uh, local uh, East Bay citizen. In fact, I came out and talked to your group uh, a few years ago and he joined me for that talk. And so this is a demonstration of what the effect of slope movement is on the surface of Carl Kauf. And here you can see at this scale, stuff only slides down towards the neck. Uh, but another possibility is it's mean annual insulation that just uh, once we understood the uh, orientation of Carl uh, Kauf's spin axis, uh, and other uh, uh, orbital elements of Arakoff, we were able to calculate, you know, from year to year to year, where are the warmer and cooler places? And lo and behold, also the neck turns out to be a, a cooler location, relatively speaking, than the other parts of Arakoff. So we can't really easily say from modeling whether we're looking at uh, bright stuff from fines sliding down or it's frost deposition, both or neither. neither. Uh, there are also interesting aligned pits you can particularly see on the larger lobe uh, and where one of those aren't maybe collapsed pit, pits from underneath a fissure. And we also see what looks like the suggestion of a, a bright diffuse material um, associated with one of the uh, pits and fissures and that could have been you know, from outgassing or an explosion at some time in Arakoth's history. Now 
Of course, the interesting question is the discreetly bordered, similar size, low mounds that make up the large lobe. Um, uh, you know, smaller, we speculate that perhaps smaller intermediate size planetesimals, the final flattened collapsing swarm came together. Another idea that people entertained for a while is that it was some actually due to some kind of, of uh, aluminum 26 uh, driven convection. Aluminum 26 is a short lived uh, uh, radionuclide, uh, which only lasts for a few million years after the solar system is formed, or less. I think I'm not exactly what its half life is off the top of my head, but it turned out that. Um, uh, we did the math and determined that it's simply not feasible with realistic parameters. So that's not how that came about. And, it's, and of course, as always, there's the possibility that we simply haven't thought of the answer, um, but at least we're trying. Now, as I alluded to before, Erkoth turns out to be really dark. Uh, you know, it typically has a, um, you know, a surface reflection of, you know, uh, of about 12, uh, you know, uh, albedo of 0.12. And uh, even the brightest places are the so-called bright patches are only uh, 0.25 and, and the darker surfaces are down to 10 or 0.1. Uh, Arrokoth uh, is really red, uh, but its neck is a little less red. And having been raised in Oklahoma, I consider myself an expert on red necks. So I can assure you that uh, we are satisfied with the actual color of the neck. Um, and here you can see examples of uh, where we merged uh, the infant uh, color with the lorry images to produce a, a, a synthetic high res color, which gives you some sense of just how really red this target is. It's amongst the most, amongst the reddest things in the solar system. And again, the composition results were interesting. The red spectrum is typical of cold classical Kuiperville objects. Um, and the, uh, Particularly, the Arakov spectrum looks similar to the spectra of the Centaur object Polis uh, and the Plutino VE95. There is a probable detection of methanol ice, which is interesting, uh, and we've detected methanol ice on other objects uh, in that part of the solar system. There's a possible detection of, of H2O, but the problem is, is the object is dark, and so you just don't get a lot of signal into the, the detectors uh, um, unambiguously identify uh, water eye, so you, you imagine it's certainly there. And, and as I said earlier in this presentation, the red color probably comes radiate from radiation-induced methane. Now, this is how we got more information about the actual shape of um, the Arrokoth by taking a series of images, which um, basically are like a, a movie of Arrokoth passing between the sun and the spacecraft. Uh, and so you'll see this fleeting crescent Arrokoth fly by here in a moment. And from the part of the sky or the stars are being blocked off by the unlit portion of Arakoth, of course, we're obviously using that information to refine our shape models. And so the models I showed you earlier all had to uh, be constrained by this sort of information. Okay, so uh, the closest approach montage took, uh, ran from uh, about nine and a half hours for closest approach to closest approach. Uh, I am happy to announce that we just finally completed uh, all the data playback, uh, and it took about 20 minutes to get all the data back down to the Earth. Now, obviously, we prioritized uh, what we thought would be high science interest data first, and the data we've been sending back in the last few months of things which were uh, sky backgrounds and things like that, which we used for satellite searches and things like that. Um, we haven't found any satellites or rings or anything of that nature, but we of course, since we had the data on the spacecraft, we wanted to do it on the ground in case somebody in the future wanted to go back to those data sets and see if they could find something we might have missed. Okay, let's talk about the origins of the binary. And this, of course, is an, an unfortunately slow animation, which always seems to be the, the fate of things you show uh, on shared screens. Okay, so a number of experiments have been performed by Richardson and uh, Moronic. Um, and um, and what we were interested in, if you take two, you know, um, smooth particle spheres and collide them at different uh, encounter velocities and trajectories, uh, which ones would form an object which looked like NU69 and which ones would just turn into uh, a mess. So we tried on the left, obviously, we're going to do 10 meters per second first and then half that speed on the right. And, Here you can see the 10 meter uh, 
beers per second at a uh, attack of 75 degrees. Uh, they just part, leaving a mess behind them. At five meters per second in the 45 degrees, and of course, 45 degrees is probably a, a, an average uh, encounter uh, trajectory for any object. Um, you can see even at this speed, though, that you really don't get anything which will look like a, that looked like a Arakoff by the time the uh, the, the uh, whole system settles down. So we did a series of these, and we did discover that when you get down to around three meters per second and slower, you will begin to form uh, nicely docked uh, binary objects, which don't appear to have done great damage to one another in the process of merging. Now, how this all came about, we imagine that there were, you know, all sorts of eddies in the planetary disk out at this distance and these uh, eddies collapse uh, and they uh, agglomerate into smaller particles and slowly but surely these particles themselves interact with one another and then there's a snapshot of the same scene here on the right which shows you know what you could interpret as an outer planet remaining out of satellite remaining bound you know short-lived inner pair that would eventually collide and so on and of course a lot of particles are lost in the system so the extent that material was colliding with other things in the cold classical cracker belt, they were simply the material that were being ejected from these eddies. And so it's all kind of from a um, same time in very early solar system history. Now, one uh, process for formation of Arakoff is just by coalescence and ejection that, uh, you know, that the rotating cloud of small particles begin to collapse in their own gravity and coalesce to form larger bodies. Eventually, only two large bodies remain uh, orbiting each other as close binaries. Uh, but there's a few la last art, uh, 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 members of the system which are eventually ejected. And the ejection, they steal angular momentum, causing the uh, last two uh, lobes to coalesce to form what we see today. Now, what's the more popular hypothesis, at least of all the cool kids uh, in uh, dynamics, is the idea of gas drag. And this is where the, the, you have two objects that are uh, rotating about a common center. As they plow through uh, the protoplanetary nebula, the gas of the planetary, protoplanetary nebula, uh, they sl that slowly steals momentum from the system and, um, and causes what uh, the people in this field call uh, hardening of the cold classical type belt binaries. Uh, and, um, I think if you, for instance, you would read the paper by McKinnon, that would be the one that they would be that would be most favored. Now that there are lots of binaries uh, coming in from the outside, that can be um, uh, implied by looking at how many comets we've uh, examined, and you can see all but two of the comets we have good images of, uh, you know, either are binaries or could, you could imagine began life as binaries. So uh, that's an indication that this is not an uncommon process. Okay, the extended mission continues. Uh, we are still looking for another KBO flyby target. Uh, we are, uh, despite COVID and everything else, and, and the fact that observatories were shut down because their, uh, their crews couldn't man the, the telescopes, we, we have gotten some serious observation time in the summer, and we are furiously uh, reducing data from some very big glass instruments. Uh, and these are all out, out like, you know, 27th, magnitude, you know, thereabouts. So it's always a challenge. And they're also against the, the field of the Sa of Sagittarius, which doesn't make, uh, make the job any easier. Um, but we uh, have already identified just this summer um, at least several dozen, dozen objects which are close enough for us to do phase studies of. And we're still searching for, hoping we'll find one more object we can fly by sometime in the next year or so. We'll keep you posted on that. So I'll end my talk by asking you to think of New Horizons as a time machine that has transported us back to the very beginning of solar system history to a place where we can observe the primordial building blocks of the planets. And with that, I'll take questions. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so I was looking at the larger lobe seems to have some structures on it. That I was wondering if the smaller lobe could have made more than one contact with the larger lobe and maybe rolled around on the surface and was actually stuck someplace else. Well, we thought, about, now. we thought about that. And um, 
we do think we see a little bit of offset in the neck itself and where there's a bit of shear when it came together, but at least the surface we saw didn't really have textures and patterns, which we thought uh, suggested that that was necessarily what was happening based upon what we could see. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, could you go over the issue of the low temperature ice and the isotope again? Because I sort of missed that a little bit. Oh, you're talking about the aluminum, aluminum 26 story? OK, it was aluminum 26. Uh, can you repeat it again? Yeah, uh, well, we were, because, you, as was just mentioned before, about the large lobe has kind of a lumpy uh, uh, texture or appearance, you know, we think the um, Occam's razor explanation for that is that those are just the lumps of other intermediate sized uh, uh, planetesimal products within the local eddy from which this object formed came together very slowly and, and retained a certain amount of their original appearance as a like a lumpy snowball. Um, but we at least entertained the possibility that the fact that those lumps are also uh, similarly sized, that they in fact might be some kind of convection pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, so we looked at what could possibly cause convection. And one idea we entertained uh, was that uh, aluminum 26, which is short lived, but could be quite hot for that quite a bit of energy, could have driven convection. But when we sat down and actually calculated the um, capability of the material to convect, given how little gravity there is, and, and, and by definition, you have to have some gravity for convection to work. Uh, it simply wasn't a plausible explanation, but at least we gave the old college try. Well, thank you. Sure. And I can always go back to share a screen if you need to look at some slides again. I shouldn't, I guess I was premature and clicking off if we need to go back to anything. Oh, go ahead. Are there are questions. Anybody have any other questions? Feel free. Well, I guess I had one. Um, yes, sir. You you had indicated um, how dark these objects are. Can you give us a tangible, um, rough idea? I mean, is it darker than asphalt, for instance? It's about as dark as asphalt. Yeah, exactly. That's what I thought. I remembered something like that. Thank you. Sure. It's dark red, though. It has. It's just you. Would, you would, if you were out there, you'd perceive its redness. In fact, that we aren't exaggerating the red in the images we've been showing people. So, what kind of status is New Horizon in right now? Is it kind of sort of in a standby, or is it actually collecting any kind of data of some sort? Oh, indeed. So it's it's collecting a great deal of data. We have a very uh, active campaign to study. What we're calling distant KBOs, where, by mean, definition, all KBOs are distant from the Earth. But in this case, we're defining distant in that they are far enough away you can't actually resolve their disks. So, as I said before, we're able to look at objects which are the size of um, of Erkoff and a little smaller, and certainly anything larger than that, out to um, you know one or so or two AU, uh, and um, we are looking at them as we fly past them and their, and their phase changes, as to say that the angle between the sun to the target to the spacecraft increases, you can learn a lot of the nature of the properties of the material that they're made of by these what's called photometric studies of the, of the, of the objects as, as the solar phase changes, the solar phase increases. And, Clearly from the Earth, you know, you never get, get much of a phase change greater than two or three degrees at most on one of these objects from, from here. They're essentially always, you know, full in the sense the moon, the moon is full. And if you want to see, you know, these things at, at uh, first or last quarter or as crescents, you know, to use uh, lunar parlance, you have to really be out there amongst them so you can actually look back over your shoulder, so to speak, and, and do those kinds of observations. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. 
also you might be interested to know that we did a thing which we uh, did just because we thought it was cool. Uh, we took uh, some images of some of the nearer stars um, uh, that we were flying perpendicular to the direction from the, from the Earth and compared those images taken of the Earth, you can clearly see um, um, parallax, easy parallax. You, you, they make, we've made stereo views of the nearer stars, which you can find on our website uh, at APL New Horizons. And so if you want to see Proxima Satori standing out against the, um, the stellar background, uh, you, can, you can do that. So how long is uh, Horizons going to last as far as power-wise? Well, power-wise, we could probably stay in communication of the spacecraft, both with respect to the power and also the fact that as you travel further out, you can just get less radiance from the antenna, um, receive, receive signal from the antenna, um, till probably sometime in the mid-2030s. Um, we're writing a proposal for an extended mission, which would begin a uh, year after next. Um, It'd be nice if we had a, a physical target to, uh, to encounter. Otherwise, we'll propose to um, continue to study um, the Kuiperville objects which we can find and, and, and make these uh, these phase measurements. And also, you can find their variations in brightness and their location. And of course, there's a lot of astrophysical applications and heliophysics applications that can be performed by the spacecraft, much in the same way that they've used the Voyager spacecraft. But our remote sensing packages are much more sensitive than the old Voyager Viticon cameras and things like that. So there are lots of things we could still do in our imaging system uh, at very low light objects or very faint objects that, that the Voyager teams couldn't do. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Back in the days when Pluto was still a planet, it seemed like our knowledge of what was beyond Pluto was sort of like nothing. And now it seems like we can find these KBOs almost at will. Is, is that kind of true or? It is true. I mean, I, it um, required the evolution of the new telescopes with the new sensors. I mean, when people really could start using CCDs and not photographic plates and people could build, you know, routinely build, you know, uh, four, five, six, and 10 meter uh, telescopes, then the ability to look for things like this uh, became really possible. So, you know, we discovered the first one like in 92 or something like that. And and then by the end of the 20th century, we found several dozen or something. And now there's you know, several thousand more have been identified. Uh, and to the point that we can actually describe these various you know, families, because we've seen enough of the population of the Kuiper Belt, uh, Kuiper Belt objects. In fact, you know, there's about a dozen other uh, you know, dwarf planets in the Kuiper Belt, uh, including Eris, which is almost the same size uh, as Pluto, and uh, higher in mass. Uh, so there's um, some weird, strange, uh, uh, exotic other worlds out in the Kuiper Belt, not just these small things like Arakoth. Uh, and, you know, for what it's worth, when you look at the three Kuiper Belt objects we have observed close up, now I'm counting uh, uh, Neptune's moon Triton as a captured Kuiper Belt object, ca captured Kuiper Belt dwarf planet. If you think of Triton as a Kuiper Belt dwarf planet and Pluto and Charon as a Kuiper Belt dwarf planet, which it is, you look at all three of them and they're all, you know, remarkably different from one another. And it suggests that, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity and uh, contingency operating out of the solar system producing a range of worlds that are every bit as diverse as the ones we see closer to the sun. You got a question on chat. Sure. I'll have to open check to see what that is. Uh, I'm bottom. bottom about density. Okay, well, you mean the, uh, the uh, particle density, how many are there per uh, volume? Um, the asteroid belt is much more dense than the, uh, the Kuiper belt is. Um, and uh, even though you can't see all the small objects in the Kuiper belt, the way you can, you can see in the asteroid belt, um, the asteroid belt is a classic uh, so-called collisionally evolved population and that's why there is always 10 times more objects half the size of any given size that you pick uh, and we know that's not the case uh, in the Kuiper belt because uh, the younger surfaces of, of Pluto as well as uh, NU69 or I'm sorry uh, Arakoth have far fewer impact features on them than do any asteroids so um, the asteroid 
belt has a lot more stuff for unit volume in it than does the Kuiper belt, although the Kuiper belt is probably several times more massive. I mean, it's almost certainly several times more massive. But it's obviously scattered. It's, it's very diffuse. So if the density of the Kuiper belt is low, what are your chances of finding a target that you can actually get to? Uh, well, honestly, it's probably on an order of a few percent, but you know, if you don't try, it's like playing the lottery. <laughs> if you aren't trying, you're not gonna find anything. And, uh, and as I say, just the exercise of finding is finding a lot of other objects which we could study and learn a lot about these things. No other spacecraft is gonna be anywhere near for probably several decades. People are already looking into the feasibility of sending a, uh, a Pluto orbiter which would probably have to use a nuclear electric propulsion to get there and slow down and get itself to orbit around the pluto Charon system. But it, once you got there, then you would also be in a position you could use the same propulsion system then to explore other hyperbole objects. So that would be a, a cool thing that would be done after our lifetimes. But you know, they, they project that would be something that would arrive there in the 2050s. So unless you've got a cryostat, it'd be something for the next incarnation. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, wh where do you run into the limit of light when you get out so far? Uh, I presume you're always l relying on the light from the sun and not necessarily from stars. So where right. do you worry about that? Well, uh, that's, you know, ultimately a function of the sensitivity and exposure times of the camera system. Um, the problem with longer exposures, they are flying up onto a target, you'll get smear, right? That was a big problem that the Voyager had because their whole Viticon tube imaging systems um, had the equivalent, now I'm gonna use a term that people only our age would even know what that means, an ASA of 10 from, from photographic film days, whereas the uh, uh, CCD imaging systems and other uh, chip imaging systems are hundreds of times more sensitive than Viticon imaging systems were or uh, so, uh, we are in good shape in that respect that we could take pictures of dim things. In fact, Aerokop is a demonstration of something that could only have been taken with the, the systems that we had uh, built and developed uh, just prior to being having flight certified and flown on New Horizons. Um, so, I mean, if we were to encounter a snowball uh, in 2030, we could take a picture of it. It was bright and had an albedo of 0.8 or something. Um, but if we continue to find things that have albedo 0.1, uh, while we could probably make out something on their surface, um, we begin to get into a problem where the light levels are so low that we have signal to noise issues with individual pixels and it might be more difficult to uh, interpret uh, the surfaces. In fact, even the Arrokoff images, we shuttered the, the imaging system many times as we came up on various observations, and we co added those images to improve our signal to noise. I mean, it's the same game people play when they take photographs of, or images of planets with the telescopes, and they, you know, co add the images for this momentary fleeting good seeing and, and make a nice image out of it. Okay, let me see if there are any other questions from. The chat. Didn't see a KB compared to. Uh, oh, I've answered that. All right. Uh, you need nudge trajectory. Yes, we can nudge the, the, the trajectory, and that's in fact how we got to uh, to Arakoff in the first place. We have enough propellant aboard the spacecraft that we can. There is a uh, cone of accessibility that extends uh, in front of the spacecraft down its its current trajectory, um, and by its nature, this cone of accessibility, which total so-called delta V left in the, the propellant tanks means that if you see something that's a year away uh, then you have a better chance of being able to burn onto the target and get that target than if you can find something that's only um, a month or two months away then it has to really be within a relatively narrow change of angle from the uh, current uh, uh, aim point of the spacecraft to be able to have enough fuel to 
retarget the spacecraft to the that location. And you have to have enough fuel aboard the spacecraft after you go to the new target to actually change the attitude of the spacecraft, which is how we point all the instruments. Now, if we were to find another Kuiperville object that required no more fuel to burn to than Arakoff did when we found it uh, in 2014, then we could certainly go and do another Arakoff-like encounter right now. Oh, do I have a value for the, yeah, I saw somebody asking about the surface temperature. Yes, the surface temperature is always between 20 and 30 K. And the density, we didn't get that directly from any gravitational, you know, from seeing a deflection in the spacecraft as it flew past uh, uh, Arakoff, but based upon the mechanical, what we infer the mechanical properties of the surface and looking at other asteroids, I'm sorry, other comets, uh, we think the density is probably around 0.5, half that of water. Where is the updated 3D model that includes what I can see visually and be suitable for a 3D printer? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I have a colleague of mine who's at Caltech named um, James Keene, who's already producing those models. And I think there's a 3D model available at the APL website. Um, if for some reason you can't find it, I'll, uh, I, I can ask and see who has one that's available and I'll send it to whoever's interested in having, a, having a, the latest and greatest version of the 3D models of, of Arakoff printed out. Happy to help out in that regards. Oh, uh, accepted outer limit uh, of an AU for the, well, yes, if you go on what we th think we knew or thought we knew based upon the uh, uh, observational studies done through the middle of the current decade, uh, we think the Kuiper begins to peter out in another few AU. So if that's really true, we'll run out of uh, um, many things to look at in another year or so of the mission. But that can also be an observational bias. Uh, and since we actually look for Kuiper objects ourselves with our own telescope, small ones that are nearby, um, in addition to uh, um, the fact we can simply bring to bear bigger and more capable uh, telescopes and, and detectors, uh, large field detectors, um, we'll see if what the real tapering of the Kuiper belt really is. So that's an ongoing study being performed, obviously, amongst other things, by New Horizons. OK, have I, have I missed anybody's chat question, or anybody out there still has more questions they'd like to ask? Uh, I hope to come back to your uh, group again. I, I think I've given talks maybe two or three times. Um, the next major mission I'm involved in is uh, the Europa Clipper mission, which uh, I'll have to um, lead a clean life to uh, <laughs> see the data. It may not get to the target for another eight years or so, but uh, when we do get there, it's going to be a very impressive uh, spacecraft carrying a, a, a quite the suite of, of, uh, of modern instrumentation, which will help us really dig at the habitability of Pluto and the, the nature of its geology and its ice shell as well as its interior. And there'll of course be some um, flybys of the other Galilean satellites as well. And also the European Space Agency has a mission called JUICE, which its main function is to, is to orbit and map Ganymede. So um, uh, we'll get back to the Kuiper Belt. Uh, I'm sorry, we back to the, the uh, Galilean satellites um, about uh, about uh, eight to 10 years from now, we uh, uh, I hope to be around and be able to come back and tell you guys what we find. Any other questions for Jeff? Someone said 50 AU then, give or take. Yes, that's, that's approximately correct. Of course, that, those numbers are always up for revision. How many objects? Oh gosh, off the top of my, I mean, of course, 
in you know theoretical numbers you know hundreds of thousands but uh, at least but uh, uh observed i should know that number but i don't it's it's in the thousands if not tens of thousands already lots of them i mean we've discovered like i said several dozen of them just looking for new things just a little narrow field of view that we're you know we can that's uh, of uh encounter interest to us just this summer and these are things that are already kind of in the back back into that of the uh, of the Kuiper belt on top of that so if you look hard you'll find lots of them is the short answer all right well then thank you everybody it was a pleasure getting mm -hmm. with you i hope next time it isn't under these strange circumstances of the year 2020 this goes to show if you live long enough you'll see anything right or, or everything all right thank Folks, you bye-bye Going to uh, close the meeting. Great, Steve. <clears throat>